I've presented in the course of this boot camp um, a variety of different methods, and uh, one could be excused for having a sense that um, you know it's a, just a grab bag of of different uh, approaches. So I, I wanted to just take uh, a few minutes at least to talk about features of a situation that suggest certain methods. And if I'm not mistaken, I've also included some slides uh, separately from this, which are, are more specific uh, choices within certain areas. So, you know, in terms of research questions, um, there's, there's a broad set of research questions where if you have some theory, you want to build some theory. Um, uh, you, you might have uh, particular questions, particularly if you have theory in the form of a model. So if you want to understand what the underlying situation of a, of a, um, of a uh, situation is, um, uh, you know, to understand the latent states, uh, understand, uh, uh, understand the value of, uh, of, of parameters, for example, um, you're going to have different needs here. To understand the underlying latent state, the state of the system, generally filtering methods, which include particle filtering and particle MCMC, Kalman filter, um, are going to give you that picture of what's going on at a given time and even trajectories. Calibration gives you, over time, um, a best for the best matched parameter values to the external data, some of what you might expect over time, but um, it's, it's not going to correct that based on incoming observations. So filtering methods are a tool of choice to know what the underlying situation is. If you're seeking to estimate poor unknown parameter values, um, uh, if they're changing over time, particle filtering is a, is a good approach to estimate them. So estimation of a reporting rate that is changing over time or, or a, uh, uh, a, a, a contact rate in, in light of the fact that people might restrain their contact due to social distancing or, or in response to advisories involving flu. Particle filtering is a very good choice there. If they're not changing over time and you want to use these sort of methods, particle uh, MCMC um, is really good for estimating, late, uh, for estimating static parameters. Um, if you want to sample probabilistically uh, and the system is deterministic, MCMC is a good, uh, good choice, but not so much so for, for stochastic systems where you really want to use um, PMCMC or particle filtering. And if you're single, trying to arrive at a single best estimate of values, calibration to data, um, uh, calibrating a model to data, which we'll talk about later today, and, and some methods for doing that, um, is really a uh, preferred choice. So here um, we have a need to establish parameter values, um, and we can do so with a variety of techniques depending on the circumstance. For the underlying situation, really, uh, particle filtering is or filtering techniques are the best, um, uh, the best uh, methods. If you have data that concerns small pieces of the system, the, for example, the relationship between one piece and another piece in isolation, of course, you could do traditional parameter estimation either directly or by so-called backing out the value by calculation from other things and use it for particular sub-pieces. It's not that, that we, have to, we have to calibrate everything or match everything against data from the whole system by any means. It's just that there are some types of things that are model outputs. There are some types of things that are produced by the model. And we can't simply say, make it so for those things in terms of their behavior over time. Because they're produced by the model, we have to tune our assumptions about the model to have it produce things that are as consistent with, with what's observed in the world as possible. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's uh, what we do with uh, some of these techniques up here. Calibration, particle filtering, particle MCMC, and MCMC. If you have a lack of theory and you're seeking to capture empirical regularities, Bopu will be presenting an example of the deep learning technique, which can be very powerful for matching, um, uh, for, for taking complex data, um, 
data, say, from an image or data over time and classifying it without a clear um, theoretical um, set of uh, a theory that emerges from it. Um, so deep learning will be an approach, it's a bit of a black box approach, uh, although there are those that, that seek to explicate what it really means. And Bo Pu will be presenting an example of this um, uh, that makes use of images um, in, a, in a talk this afternoon. Um, and then finally, if you're seeking to assess pre uh, presence or relative strength of, of, of causal impact on system variable A on B, um, CCM is your, is your ticket. So in terms of filtering methods, um, you know, we have talked about PMCMC and particle filtering. Really these methods give, allow us to sample from, or provide a joint estimate of, of distributions of system state, what the system is doing right now, um, uh, and sometimes with, with parameters as well, in light of the model and, and time series. Um, and by so doing, you can keep the model aligned with data over time and then project forward or examine the impact of, of, um, of estimation on, on, um, on interventions. So this would say impact of interventions. Okay, um, so that's what these methods are designed to do, is to allow us to keep our models honest, keep them aligned with data, estimate the underlying situation of the model, which allows us to know what's going on right now with greater clarity. For example, how many people might be sourcing opioids from dealers without us having data on it. And then, we'll see an example of that this afternoon from the opioid area. But beyond that, they allow us to ask what's, given that picture, what's likely going to happen down the road, in Xiaoyan's case, um, looking for it six months, a year, maybe in some cases supporting what's going on two years down the road, or critically ask what if, what, what if we were to put this policy in place, what if we were to, uh, to launch a, a um, outbreak response immunization campaign for pertussis in this age group, how might that affect things versus a general promotion of, of vaccination versus school closure and, and, um, and keeping uh, kids from, from mixing at schools versus some sort of quarantine measures. So we can examine the impacts of, of interventions. Um, now, now, based on the character of the underlying state, I should have said this earlier, you'll do different things. If, this, if the state is discrete, for example, if you have categorical states, you know, uh, outbreak or not, or um, on pers is the phone on person or off person, or is the person in a vehicle or not? Or am I sitting, standing, lying down? Is the phone off person, or am I engaged in active, non-sedentary activity? Um, if that's what you've got, you've got these discrete states, not continuous states where you want to know how many people are susceptible or how many people are sourcing opioids from dealers out there. If, if what you have is categorical states, hidden Markov modeling is a, is a very attractive technique. You want to probe, for example, is the screen of, ethic of the phone on or off with Ethica data, as Tina has done with quite some success. Then a hidden Markov model provides you insight. By contrast, if you have continuous state, you can have more people sourcing, uh, sourcing opioids from dealers or fewer. We can have more people infected or fewer, more people exposed and fewer, more people susceptible and fewer. We have a model, in short, which has a continuous state, such as depicted by, C by uh, state space reconstruction in the oculus or other, source, or other factors. We can make use of particle filtering and particle MCMC. You won't make use of hidden Markov model. Hidden Markov model is for categorical um, situations and where somewhat uh, simpler assumptions are, are, are most uh, efficacious or most, most appropriate. Um, if you need to estimate plausibly or clearly static parameters, particle MCMC, you really want to consider it. If, if you don't need to, particle filtering um, should be adequate. Uh, particle MCMC gives 
this extra ability to estimate static parameters. Um, uh, it does estimate trajectories over time of the system, but you could do that with particle filtering if you just build an ancestry matrix. And if people are interested, I'd be glad to provide code to do that. Kalman filtering is an older technique. I don't recommend it in the health area um, uh, because it doesn't handle highly nonlinear systems well, like we're routinely grappling with. And in its setup for very efficient, time frugal, but very simplistic calculations, and it has very restrictive assumptions distributionally, meaning it, it assumes that errors uh, in the system, system noise and, and inaccuracies are are distributed in a normally distributed fashion. And what that does is really limit um, uh, the applicability of the method, particularly in the health sphere, where often that's very clearly violated. So Coleman filtering is a great approach if you have a car that needs to estimate its position based on some internal model and, and GPS data or a plane. It's not a very good match for the health sphere. We've applied it to great success, actually, um, in certain spheres when we couple it with data from smartphones, for example. Uh, so we have a published paper on use of common filtering. But I would use particle filtering uh, even for those situations for just greater clarity on what's likely going on. It's not that it's not useful at all. It also assumes um, that the system can be linearized, which really limits it to system dynamics models rather than, than agent-based models, which is another big limitation. So estimation method, um, uh, these are for estimating parameter values. Calibration, which we'll be talking about today, estimates parameter values, typically a point prediction of parameter values um, that, are, that govern the system in light of model and some data. So the idea is we estimate a, a, a privileged set of parameters that best match, the, allow the model to best match the observed data, where both the data and uh, the data and what we're matching it against are out, are emergent features. So, so this is data that we can't just plunk into a parameter value because it doesn't relate to one parameter alone. It relates to the, to the emergent patterns we see from across many areas of the system or, or significant areas of the system. And it, it therefore is a complex fact, a complex function of many, uh, many types of parameter information and model state over time. We can't just plug it into a parameter value. It, it doesn't relate to just one. It, it's t entangled a combination of other ones. So what we do is we match the model output with that observed data, um, where the model output is, is also emergent. And we find the parameters that best match, that allow the model to best match it, the, the assumptions about the model that allow it to best match it. We can calibrate to multiple types of data. In agent-based models, we can calibrate to longitudinal data on an individual, Yang Chen, who I don't think is here today, um, uh, has done this um, uh, a great deal to very good effect with her gestational type 2 diabetes model. We can also calibrate to cross-sectional data um, uh, and to time series data, uh, data over time. Um, for an agent-based model, um, it, it may require real, uh, for an, for for an agent-based model, it's common if it uses many, many runs per, per, for each trial set of parameters, uh, parameter values, it may run, you may want to run it more than once because of stochastics. And it provides point estimates of parameters, so it's, it's not giving you a distribution. By contrast, it is a distribution that MCMC gives you. It samples from values of parameters um, jointly uh, and gives you a, a, a picture in terms of the distribution of likely parameter values. It's not advised for stochastic models uh, for reasons I don't totally grok. I am told by mathematical statisticians that um, MCMC is really not applicable for uh, stochastic models, uh, just as particle filtering is not applicable for, uh, to estimate totally static parameters. Um, in both cases, you'd be advised to get a PMCMC if you have a stochastic model or if you want to estimate static parameter values, use PMC instead of K2. 
calibration or set of MCMC on the one hand and, and particle filtering on the other. And in principle, and this is something I've been discussing with Xia Yan, in principle, you can use MCMC to sample from multiple models and to assess which model is most likely. Um, and in light of that model, uh, what, what uh, good parameter values are. Um, it's rarely done in practice and it requires, and it's particularly tricky, particularly fraught if you have different parameter spaces for the different models. You're, you, over here for this model, your parameters A and B you have to, you have to sample from, and this other one you, you have uh, D, E, and F. Then it's very hard to sample from them. Um, okay. Um, um, I speak louder than that. Um, uh, so, um, so anyway, um, uh, those are those are some comments on that where I'm trying to draw together these couple of techniques because I presented I know MCMC and PMCMC and I'll present calibration and present particle filtering and present HMMs. When do you use them? Well, I've tried to provide at least a bit of guidance and I'll try to refine this. You know, categorical states, you should think about HMMs. You're trying to, you're just trying to arrive at point estimates for parameters, calibration. You want to sample from a distribution of parameters, MCMC, unless your system is stochastic, in which case PMCMC. You want to estimate static parameters and underlying dynamic state PMCMC. You want just want to sample the underlying state of the system and some dynamic parameters, particle filtering. These are, are some recommendations. If you want to assess the causal influence, um, this, should, this should say causal influence um, of system variable A on B than, than CCM. So I've tried to sort of boil down some good rules of thumb here. Any questions on this? Questions on, on this sort of broad choice? This is what goes through my, <laughs> you may feel bad for me, but uh, th when a student talks with me about a model, these are what are the things going through my head as to what technique I recommend. This is like my, my it's not quite my cheat sheet, but it's like my, uh, my rules of thumb that, uh, that I, might, I might guide the student. So, Again, I you know point towards uh, particle filtering and, and particle MC and C, whereas Young Chin yesterday presented a hidden Markov model, um, and Tina's has a hidden Markov model for for classifying whether the screen the state of the the screen state of the phone is on or off, uh, for example. Um, so, questions on this that I could answer. This is in the reference materials I provided for you, so this little sheet, although I have to update it with the typos. Questions? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I missed the keyword. Uh, in order, there's efforts being made to what? Like reverse engineering. Reverse engineering. Like, yeah. So we don't know the factors, but then all this yep. coming back. Yep. Yep. Is that correct? But mm. at this point, it's still largely black box. Am I correct? Uh, largely. I mean, um, there's some. Th thanks for asking about this. And actually, I um, I have some slides germane to this, and, and sort of in other places, which I might try to provide, um, but uh, 
deep learning, um, so deep learning is an approach uh, that's currently probably the single hottest, yeah. sort of, and certainly single most hyped. Um, and and I, I don't mean to say it's not substantive, but it absolutely is substantive. It's just, it's what got people chatting and sort of chatting beyond, uh, beyond grounded understanding of it sometimes. It's the thing that's fired the imagination of people. Um, and uh, there's something there that they're excited about, of real substance. Um, but, um, you know, it's kind of got a life of its own at the moment. Um, uh, commercially, where you people hear people talking about it, and, and uh, you know it's it's associated with market textures and um, and you know promotion of product as well as uh, being talked about in, in terms of its potential um, contributions to society. It's a technique whose roots I followed for many years. I remember, and and really for those of us old enough um, uh, to remember the. <laughs> the pre-internet era, <laughs> which Jeff notes seems to be a distinction and um, of, of significance in explaining, um, you know, differences and orientations between generations. Um, uh, will many of us will remember that actually this is the third wave of profound enthusiasm about what are known as connectionist methods? Okay, so the first wave was was work of, um, uh, that was centered around perceptrons. Um, and the, gosh, it was, uh, I think in the 70s. Um, but it, it ended up getting inflated by two professors uh, at MIT, uh, Seymour Papert and, and Marvin Minsky, who, who basically showed that while the, the perceptron as a neural architecture, as an architecture which aspired to mirror the brain in its structure, it, it, it fell profoundly short of the idea that it would revolutionize the world because it couldn't even capture some simple things like an exclusive or function. Um, and people said, oh, we've been reading too much into this. You know, um, we thought that this would be the universal architecture. We'd create the artificial brain which would now be able to solve all the world's problems and, and now we realize, wait, it's profoundly limited. And so there's a backing off from it that occurred with perceptron. But there was something there with perceptrons. And, and um, it's not to say they had no value. Actually, for certain things, they were quite nice. But it was a very simple little linear element um, uh, that uh, was overplayed by popular press. And then in the late 80s, early 90s, um, uh, just at the time I was actually taking a course from what was arguably, well, certainly one of the top couple most influential people in connectionist methods computationally, a guy named Michael I. Jordan, who, who later went on from MIT to, uh, to uh, Berkeley. Um, he, he taught a course at MIT on neural networks, which were kind of the new, the new instantiation of connectionist approaches and the new hot thing. And people were saying at that time, you know, Neural networks are going to revolutionize the world. We're going to have artificial brains. They're going to solve all sorts of engineering problems. They're going to solve all sorts of problems where we don't have good rules, good principles for solving them, you know, um, in a in a structured, defined, um, um, uh, defined theoretically grounded fashion. They're going to recognize these patterns and and allow us to to have much more robust ways of deciding things, etc. And, um, and I was actually rather excited about neural networks. I thought they were pretty interesting. I wrote my own neural network simulator and applied them to issues. And, and Michael Jordan was, was uh, actually a very, very good uh, lecturer at the time. And he had, he had shown that you could basically argue that neural networks are reducible to and, and, and are another way, a nice way of thinking about nonlinear regression approaches. Um, uh, and, and, and both are very powerful. Um, and uh, he demonstrated how they could be applied and, and uh, to great effect uh, for a lot of problems. But um, uh, eventually, the, again, this popular conception this kind of big AI conception that, okay, now we have the artificial brain. 
And that artificial brain will grow, and it will grow, and grow, and it'll grow bigger than Einstein's brain. Um, and, you know, it'll become more and more wise and, and knowing, and, um, and, you know, it'll allow us to solve all these problems. There were a lot of petty ideas at the time. Um, uh, there were projects, you know, trying to feed news stories in with the idea that, that out of this would emerge a, uh, an intelligence that knows how the world works because it's read all these news stories from U.S. newspapers and, and, and you know, would be able to kind of know the ways of these, of these people, um, these, these homo sapiens sapiens. It knows how they behave. Um, and uh, there was the psych project, CYK. One of my friends from MIT worked on it, et cetera. Um, and it was a heady time. It was a very heady time. AI Alley was booming at MIT, et cetera. And neural nets delivered on actually quite a bit of the vision. I mean, they're used for this. I don't know if this is going to shock you. I don't know if it's good or bad. But, you know, they're used to decide, for example, credit score uh, worthiness of, of a given applicant. You know, looking at their, their history, um, is this someone safe? To, um, to to uh, provide a credit card to um, you know to, to write a credit card with a high with a high balance limit um, etc. Um, neural nets um, were used uh, very successfully in a number of domains like optical character recognition um, and uh, they took the world by storm. I knew people over at the Laboratory for Information and Decision Science. Sciences, and uh, they were trying to solve these these quite interesting problems. You know, uh, that that's an example of one. Um, and neural nets came in and and uh, cleaned up shop in some areas in terms of how to recognize these things, how to recognize handwriting. Actually, I mean, these are things where it's it's very idiosyncratic. Um, uh, Christine can tell you sometimes with certain professors' handwriting, it's almost intractable to, to recognize, you know? And, and neural nets could do, uh, as I understand it from, from the literature, they could do a really good job in, in understanding what, what thing was written in that chicken scratching. I think doctors are also notoriously problematic in <laughs> settings. Hmm? <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, well, Brian and I can write on something. We'll give it to Christine. And, um, <laughs> so, so she could tell us which of us should be locked up sooner. Um, uh, so, uh, so neural nets, and, and I want to draw a distinction here between the hype, which was, you know, they're going to they're gonna solve the world problem. There's going to be this big brain, and it's going to be sitting there and pulsing. You know, and it's gonna it's gonna be able to solve all these problems and recognize human behavior and so on. I want to distinguish that from the small AI successes, which were great and very significant, about being able to solve these modest, unassuming problems. But that wasn't what the public was excited about. You know, it wasn't oh, we can recognize handwriting um, as cool as that is. It, they were they were more into okay, it's gonna be able to understand the rules of politics and, you know, um, and, and be able to parse out uh, the, the greater functioning of, 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 you know, the human society and how it can function more effectively, what have you. And so the big, the idea that this would be an artificial brain, which would soon lecture us in a stentorian voice about, you know, how to, how to, how to decide weighty problems, proved to be defeated. Um, it, neural networks didn't developed that way um, successfully, but they solved an incredible number of little small problems really nicely. Um, but there was a sense of, and this gets into the whole, I tell my students, managing expectations is one of the most important things you could do in a project in life. And in the popular mind, they were, they kind of failed. Um, people said, oh, they were old, old hat, you know, they, they were overhyped and they didn't deliver. But from the side of those who were working on them, like Michael Jordan, most in the trenches, they were actually quite successful. It's, it's quite successful. I don't think he was going around and, and, and hyping them up. In fact, he was showing 
in, in, in um, technical and, and very closely argued technical papers just how they were similar and they could be fit into the rubric of previous methods and so on. Um, he had some humility, but the hype didn't. And, and so it seemed like a big letdown to many people. It was like, we were told they were gonna, they were gonna be able to you know, write music and you know, be 10 times as good as Bach or whatever. And, and, and you know, here, here we don't even you know, get something as good as Bon Jovi or something. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm joking a bit, but you know, we, we don't get something that's very impressive from them on that front. And, and yet, at, at, a, at a level of technical application in the small, small AI, they were highly successful. Particularly with things that are sort of, sort of uh, involve um, uh, fuzzy areas where, you know, like handwriting recognition, where formulating the sync rules is hard. Recognizing images became a big one. And so then, in recent years, in the past five years, there's been this rise of the third big wave of connectionist approaches, and, and which center around deep learning. And you'll hear about this from Bo in an application. And deep learning has taken the world by storm. Again, you know, it's, 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 it's another of these waves around this idea of people talk about, okay, big pulsing brain this time, you know, uh, the, the details are a bit different. Um, uh, instead of feeding it in news clippings from the you know New York Times, we'll fill it in Twitter tweets or what have you, and, and uh, um, it will it'll discover um, great things. But the truth is that the deep learning is a much more sophisticated and um, a lot has been learned about neural nets, how to apply them well, and a lot has been learned about where they work well and so on. And the architectures to support them and the computational infrastructure has come a long way. And the number of them that we can simulate, et cetera, has come a very long way. Um, and deep learning architectures, uh, Bo will give you, a, you know, a glimpse of, of one application, um, like uh, TensorFlow, have, have allowed us to represent systems of connectionist structure, these kind of interconnected neural-like sy um, systems that are very sophisticated, that can take advantage of computing power in remarkable ways, and that can process large amounts of input information in a way that dwarfs what we could do you know, in the late 80s or early 90s, even in that psych project in Texas feeding in news stories. Um, uh, that, that project was, was, was run by um, a guy whose name was Doug Lanat, and I knew again one of the important people in that project. Um, and uh, he was from MIT, um, as were a lot of these folks. And uh, at MIT, he was viewed very skeptically. Um, this this guy who was saying they're going to have this computer; it's going to be self-aware and you know able to be at the intelligence of a four-year-old and then a seven-year-old and then a twelve-year-old and then an eighteen-year-old. What about that? And, you know, 28 year old and, and so on. Um, and, uh, and, but at MIT, people were pretty skeptical of this hype. And in fact, his name, if you look up in the, in the Hacker Dictionary, which I have in my office, and where you can find definition of many other elements in my lexicon, of, um, you will find Doug Lanada is listed. And it's associated, like my name, I, I have a unit named after me based on some, some of my past experience. It's a long story. Um, a unit of dent uh, in a wall uh, from a golf ball. Um, uh, the odds good. Um, uh, but um, he, he had a unit also. His unit, um, the standard reference for his unit, for Doug Lanat, um, this, this sort of promoter of this AI vision that AI was going to revolutionize the war with the world, his. his um, his uh, unit was the micro Lanat, and it was a unit of bogosity. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, a, a, a micro Lanat is highly bogus. So you can only imagine what a full Lanat is, is, is like. So this was a time where a lot of tech folks in the mid 90s, or so early 90s, late 80s, a lot of tech folks were riding the kind of wave of hype 
and getting massive amounts of funding flowing into their companies. And some were, were not, um, some were not principled in how they responded to it. And Doug Lanott was very successful in, in you know, raising money uh, for his vision. Now, the deep learning, um, there's tremendous amounts of potential for deep learning. But there's also tremendous overhype of deep learning. It's fantastic for certain types of things. Audio recognition, like Bopu is applied, it's a great tool. Video, visual recognition, great tool. Um, recognizing things that are like uh, each other, um, uh, it's, it's fantastic, um, you know, from images. Recognizing that these images are not, are not suitable for minors. Uh, these images are, um, are of, you know, a, um, of a zebra. It's pretty good. Although I will tell you, when I searched, I searched um, to test this out, I searched, I think, two years ago on pictures of, of uh, pandas. Um, of, 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 of Panda uh, online on Google image search to search for images like this. And it uses deep learning to recognize if the images are similar. And so it showed me all these images of zebras, but it also showed me a few, uh, yeah, zebras in addition to the pandas. So there were, there were quite a few zebras and quite a few pandas there. Um, and, um, and you know that's an indication of its its kind of limits. And with a little child, you could imagine it thinking that, right? Oh, it's got black and white, and you know, it, it's an animal, and it, it must be a panda. Um, but it's it's not. Um, so uh, deep learning is really great for those uh, sort of problems where once again formulating you know, formulating to find rules is, is difficult. I'll give another example from the medical area where. You know, it's it's sort of it's uh, it's an exemplar of how it can be used. Um, so I'm someone who's who's been diagnosed with early stage skin cancer at times, and I've had to have uh, skin removed because of that. I have to be very careful in the sun. Um, and uh, one of the things that deep learning can be used to, to great great effect is to recognize um, moles or other skin perfections that are worrisome. And once again, this is a matter of some judgment, right? It's like any, any rule about it is, um, is going to be very, um, very unclear. It's based on images. And you know, there have been these wonderful instances of people crowdsourcing these images of things. And it can work pretty well on white people. Um, you know, and this is one of the dangers when you, when you have these tools uh, do you really want to train them on just samples from Caucasians and have, you know, this system that is a bit black boxish, well, quite black boxish, try to recognize then samples um, and say, oh, all these samples from non-white people are safe. You have to be very careful about those things of overfitting because nowhere is it represented this works on whites, you know, and, and nowhere is, is the skin color directly represented with one variable. But deep learning has been very interesting also going beyond traditional neural networks um, with, with hidden layers and architectures that allow us to recognize some of the underlying sort of archetypes that it looks for. Um, so when you recognize certain types of images, for example, it turns out different areas of the network pick out certain features. From the, from the image. They, they abstract certain elements of the image. Where, um, and there's a kind of self-teaching of the network to recognize salient components of the image without being taught to do so, which is intriguing because you, you get these sort of, uh, you can actually elicit from these by, with, with appropriate sort of um, manipulation of a train network, you can get it to show you kind of its archetypical image of what sadness looks like. And it will show you, you know, a face that, that has certain features in it, or what happiness looks like, or what lying looks like, or what um, surprise looks like. And it brings out these features visually in terms of the, um, in terms of the face from the hidden layers of this network. 
it's, 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 it's very compelling. And so it, it's recognized latent features of the situation that, are, that underlie a general rule. Um, sometimes, you know, with, with, with shocking levels of, of recognition. But what it doesn't give you is an articulated theory causally why we see influences later in time from a disturbance earlier in time. It, it's not, it can be used with dynamics, so recurrent neural networks are used quite a bit with, with uh, behavior over time. But it's not, form, it's formulated in a sort of somewhat atheoretic fashion, and you're not going to get out an inducement of theory. There are other machine learning approaches which seek to derive what are the equations, the differential equations underlying a system based on observations of the system, which are intriguing, but they're not based on, on I'm not aware of any that are based on deep learning right now, but deep learning for recognition, like for classification of is this a panda or not, or is this is this face happy or not, or rank this face in terms of happiness and you know versus versus other features, or classify from this person's text where they rank on the big five personality characteristics or what have you. It's actually remarkably good for a lot of those features. But it's a different it's a different sort of need than we've been focusing on for most of the boot camp, but one that's highly complementary. And I personally feel that the sort of work that you had presented this morning with tweet classification, there's a good case to be made that probably we could do better with additional samples, because um, she only had 358 positive ones uh, in the training set. There's a lot larger in the other set. Um, but um, with enough extra examples, we could probably have a neural architecture, one based on deep learning that would, uh, that would classify. Um, better yet. It would, it, would, it would pick up some features. But, you know, um, these types of systems uh, have to be evaluated very carefully. You have to watch out that they don't privilege certain groups, that, they, that they're tested with a broad enough set of, of, uh, of backgrounds. And, um, you know, you, you, you want to try to get an explanation for why it thinks this, which is sometimes thwarted. When it comes to s characterizing complex systems, um, I have yet to see any significant evidence that deep learning will provide good solutions in the near future. But deep learning provides excellent solutions for a broad class of problems that are supportive of the sorts of techniques we're talking about here. You know, for example, classifying streams of tweets so we can Put them into a particle filter, right? Um, together with a model, or allowing us to recognize whether someone's inside or outside, so we can use that data set to calibrate our model against, um, or we could use it to understand the impacts of a service dog on on um, on that particular pathway, how it affected, how much time they're spending inside and outside. In short, I think it's a wonderful technique for. Uh, for certain more narrow types of questions. For grappling with complex systems, um, you know, I will, I will wait to, to see. My own observation is that the people who do deep learning, by and large, um, are not aware of, particularly, of this issue of, of complexity in real world systems, and they're not trying to address those sort of questions. Um, so that was a long answer to a short story, but we'll see uh, to a short question, but we'll see more of this uh, this afternoon when when Bo uh, presents his uh, visual recognition um, presentation. Okay, questions? Other follow-on questions? Some? Is it is it that time, Christine? Oh yeah, man! You have like six minutes before lunch. Oh wow! Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Maybe break for lunch and then come back for. Yeah, I think that's 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 a fine idea. Let me just glimpse at um, whether I need to um, make any vocalizations on other fronts. Um, uh, okay, so um, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, 
No, I think I think uh, we're good for uh, good until lunch. Then, um, is it does it is lunch in in evidence? Okay. Okay. Okay, lunch is served. Yes, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> What's the origin of the Oslo years? <laughs> Many years ago, in a galaxy, well, actually, in this very galaxy, in this very planet, I carried with me different habits as a youth. And, um, but I had some some similarities, um, and um, one of them was that um, I, I'm not I'm not very good at sports, um, uh, and uh, I, I I enjoy certain sports, as I mean, you know, go running each day, etc. But um, I'm not a, a sportsman, um, and uh, I was I was an intern. Um, during my undergrad years, um, and uh, one of the places I, I served as an intern was at Microsoft. And this was during the late late eighties. Uh, I believe this particular year would have been eighty eight, eighty eight. Um, and um, it was quite a time at Microsoft. Um, a lot of the people I know are now billionaires, um, and. Uh, <laughs> There's one guy who, who's, I think, a multi-billionaire now who uh, absolutely would not, he, he did not believe in putting money in banks, so he put all his money into his mattress. <laughs> I have no idea what happened you know, to those habits subsequently. Um, I sort of a very good mattress. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was and, and I have an, an amazing, I, I will tell you, I, I do have an amazing ability financially, which is to refuse opportunities that are really good. <laughs> and, and someone, someone, it, it, the company did offer me to get stock options, and someone there told me, 1988, Microsoft stock has gone as high as it ever will. <laughs> no, don't bother that. Um, and so I said, no, I'm not, not going to uh, buy, buy stock business. That's uh, not good. Um, uh, so, uh, so anyway, um, there was a group there, one of, one of Microsoft's um, more enduring cultural elements was uh, a lot of the employees would, um, would take breaks by engaging in uh, uh, sort of um, recreational activities within the, the buildings. Um, and there was a foosball table and that sort of stuff. But one of the ways they would do this was they would, um, they would play golf. <laughs> they play golf. Um, they play golf inside, <laughs> and they would typically do so about 5 p.m., 5:30 p.m. Um, and I was not averse to working late. And 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 then there would be these sets of golfers, and they would come through, you know, with their with their uh, irons and what have you, and and they'd be going through the hallways. There these big buildings one through four were these big X buildings. They're still there, you can see them from Google, Google Earth. They're these big sort of Xs. And so they'd play golf up and down things. You know, the ball would go off into the, to the stairwell and it would go off into the lobby. And, and you know, these ball, golf balls would go zinging down. But they were very careful about making sure no one was there. They'd yell for and you know, <laughs> make sure no one else came out. And people kind of knew the shtick and, and would stay out of the way. Anyway, so I was there through the summer as an intern. And on my last day of work, or the day before the last, I can't remember which, they said, Nate, don't you want to join the golf? I said, no. My grandmother, who was Scottish ancestry, was really pushing at me to golf, but it was always like, get out there, she didn't say it this way, but <laughs> if Jeff were to express it, he'd say, she would say, get out there with those suits, you know, this is how you're going to meet important people, this is how you're going to, you know, get influential friends, this is how you're going to advance in life by golfing with them, and that was just not for me. I wasn't, wasn't interested in that. Um, and I was more interested in these things called simulation models. Um, <laughs> cellular automaton. And yes, neural networks was another thing which interested me at that time. Um, anyway, um, so they, they, they said, look, look, at least try it a little bit with us. And I said, well, I said, you have to understand, I'm really bad at golf. And they said, oh, come on, you can't do anything. Um, 
Now, mind you, there are these like there are these offices. We had offices, and they had glass next to them, and so on. But but you know, it was reinforced with wire, et cetera. And so, you know, don't worry about it. They like said people are you know to stay out of the way. So, so, so I said, okay, look, I don't even know how to hold the stick. Um, <laughs> you know, you got to show me how to how to how to hold. It. What do I do with the stick? Um, and, and they showed me, they said, you know, just, just take it. And, and, and so I, so, so I, I, I said, okay. So, you know, I stood and ramped up and swung. And um, I was not a weak youth. I, I'm just a weak adult. Um, but in my youth, I actually did a lot of physical work. And, um, and what's more notable yet is uh, I did take a very strong swing. More than, because they told me, like, they said, look down the hall, look, look, it's hundreds of meters away, you know. Um, um, you know, just, 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 just give it a good solid swing to get it mostly down to the end of the hall. So I did. But it, it only went about, um, about half a meter or so. Um, and it hit the wall. Um, and, it, and, and it hit the wall with such force. They, they said, whoa, um, <laughs> that's wild. And you went up to it, and you could see the dimples on the ball embedded <laughs> in the wall. I can't actually remember if it actually stuck into the wall. Like, 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 so you had to extract that. I can't remember what sureness, but what I do remember very clearly is the dimples <coughs> in the wall. And they said, like, they've never seen anything like that. You know, they've seen dents. But this is like, this is a big <laughs> dent. This is the biggest dent they've ever seen. This is an Osgood. Um, <laughs> and, and I know where that dent is. <laughs> and supposedly it has been preserving um, over these three decades. Um, it's about three decades ago. And what's weirder than that is that <laughs> this is really bizarre. <laughs> and I can't remember how I found out. Maybe it was someone I saw an old acquaintance from Microsoft who told me. My name is in Sports Illustrated for this incident. We must look this up. So I'm, I, I, it, it mentions me. I think it says an intern named Osgood, you know, uh, created the unit of, 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 of bad golfing called an, an Osgood. It's a, it's a dent unit. And there have always been, ever since then, there have been a lot of dents, but ne never has there been even one of Osgood. Well, all I could say is I'd rather have an Oscar named after me than a micro Lanat. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so that's the that's the uh, the Oscar. And, and so I'm I'm bizarrely the only one I know in the world that's ever, you know, uh, that that's ever been in Sports Illustrated, especially for being a bad sportsman. You know, um, but but it is there. I did find it. You didn't tell them that's si. part. Com. What's up? The fact that. Someone called him later and begged him to come work for him well, that's at Microsoft Office. Chased him around his dorm because Nate couldn't really decide whether he wanted to work with Bill Gates or not. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is that is that is true. Well, um, after that Bill, first incident, Bill, he wasn't sure. Bill, Bill yeah, Bill did yeah. call me. Um, yeah, <laughs> and um, it wasn't about the Oscar. But actually, he called a friend of mine too. Yeah, and and actually. I, I was more polite to Bill, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but this friend of mine said, "No, I don't want to go to Microsoft." And Bill said, "Why not?" And he said, "Windows sucks." <laughs> <laughs> and Bill said, "Yeah, I know. We're working on that. <laughs> you know, we've got this thing called NT. Um, <laughs> okay, Windows 2000. No, this is serious. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, um, um, and." Uh, he didn't get he didn't get that guy one time. No. Oh. And on that note, guys, let's just sort of strange life. Yeah. <laughs>